To whom much is given, much is required. Part of that requirement is sharing. Culture is the heartbeat within our lives, and it's at the core of so many things. While we live in a time when we are starving for wisdom, I welcome you to your wisdom retreat at Culture Raises Us. Bobby Carter, today's guest. Some may know him as the one and only DJ Cousin B, who's an amazing DJ, by the way. But but he's also one of the key executives, uh, visionaries, producer behind Tiny Desk at NPR. And, you know, while Tiny Desk has been around for years, I mean, we could safely say, I, I think it's also safe to say that they have hit quite the level with the impact they're having in the music culture space. And before we have him kind of walk us through his journey, I want to start with when you hear culture, what does that mean to you, bro? Yeah, that's... You know, I, I I think about that a lot because the word is thrown around a lot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in a nutshell, for me, it's the everyday people in society, the people who move the needle, the people who set the trends, the people who dictate what matters right now. Um, But they're also they're also the people who are unseen, who are who aren't heard. Um, who society and pop culture tend to borrow and steal from. Um, and they, they aren't given the credit for what happens right now, who dictates what matters right now. So in a nutshell, like the culture, it's, it's my people. It's my um, people. Uh, you know, you saying the, you know, the people behind the scenes exact, exactly exemplifies what we try to highlight here, right? Here are the stories, uh, are the individuals, the cultivators like yourself. And I, I'm so glad that you had that as your definition or a key component of what culture means to you. Uh, you know, That's again- Before we even get into it, also the culture is you because, you know, you are a prime example of being a mentor from afar. You know, you and I, we've mm -hmm. known each other for a long time and we met through our brother, J May. And we'll go a couple years without really talking, but like you've been such an example for me of moving culture, dictating culture, family, God, and doing all of that while being fly. That's that's the <laughs> that's the key thing, though. Is that, that that's you know the key things, right? You can do all of those things, but when you make it look fly, that's the stuff that I look up to. So, brother. I just want to thank you for like being a mentor from afar for all of these years, for well over a decade, man. And you are culture. Oh man, I appreciate you for for the kind sentiment. I, I receive it and, and and thank you. Um, but so again, like you just said, we've known each other for a very long time. I've had the pleasure of getting to know you on many many levels. Yeah. Give people a little bit more about who Bobby is all about. Man, I am a I am a kid born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, North County, on the north side of St. Louis. Um, a kid who is uh, obsessed with music. It's the thing that drives me. It's the thing that wakes up everything inside of me. It's the, the thing that I'm good at. You know, when you get, you know, I'm great at, <laughs> you know, appreciate that. But it's, it's the thing that it's the spark. So I'm just a kid from the Lou who has discovered not long ago his power his impact um his authenticity um who who's proud of where he's from i'm an hbcu alumni jackson state university um and i'm just at the end of the day i'm, I'm a black man in, in in society who's really really trying to leave a mark and, and carve out a lane for people just like me um to take anything that i do a step further yeah, and you're probably one of the more humble people that I know. Um, and I love your your the, the way you move in your humble nature. And like I said, you know, recently I had the pleasure of attending a taping of Tiny Desk while I was dropping my oldest daughter off at college in D.C., thanks to you. And I got to tell you, the amount of joy it brought to me seeing your leadership and your presence in that space was special. You know, and I want to applaud you for your commitment and your desire to make sure that we're represented in the most impactful way possible, literally. And I think this is a key reason why I felt like or feel like you are such a key part of the evolution of music culture. 
And and given your your experience within music culture over the years, was there a particular moment where you realized just how big and instrumental this music culture was to overall culture? Well, you know, Asa, like I said, like the thing, music and music culture, I don't recall a time in my life where it wasn't the most important thing other than God and family. Uh, so as a child, um, I knew that my my call and my purpose was to do something in music. Now, I've never played an instrument other than the saxophone for maybe a couple weeks, and I kept breaking the reeds, and I gave that up. Finally got into DJing when I was in high school. But other than, you know, I play sports, and I was never, I was good enough to play, but I didn't excel. It was more so a means my, my mom kept us in it to keep us out the streets and more so of a social outlet. You know, I really learned how to uh, get along with others as a kid through sports. It was also an outlet to see other parts of the country, but I was never really good at it. You know, I was good enough to play, but I, you know, but it was music. I was always the weird music kid. I all, you know, I used to get on the bus when I used to get on the bus to go to school, I was always the kid with the headphones on, right? The headphones on. But what I would do, I would turn the Walkman up as loud as possible in silent moments while we were on the bus just to get somebody to hear what I was listening to so we could talk about it or just to get that, yo, what's that? Mm. There's nothing like even today. Turning somebody on to something. So even as in high school, Music discovery was the thing, you know what I mean? I, I there was, There's nothing like someone looking at you with that look on their face and saying, yo, what's that? That's right. You know what I mean? That's right. And even back then in, in middle school and high school, that was always my thing, like putting people up onto something fresh and new and, 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 and allowing them and, and getting them to dive down that rabbit hole to learn about who this artist is and going deep into the liner notes. I was a music nerd. So I knew this culture was moving me in ways that not other people were moving as a young, young, young kid. It's everything. You, you know, when you tell your story about your youth and your inability to excel in the sporting area, <laughs> it's it's crazy that as you say that, I'm looking at how, look how God works, firstly. Yeah. Because the the key principles that you picked up in sports, like I saw firsthand how you got down and you're leading on that tiny desk stage, literally and figuratively, and in that setting with people and the respect that you gain and get from people in that space. And I think it's a total reflection of your sport history. Yeah. Your, 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 the time that you spent in sports and the principle that you picked up that you now are executing and putting into play through your love of music, through this tiny desk platform and everything else you do. Because I saw that. I saw your ability to work with people. You respect people. It's so wild how, you know, when when you make the call or you guys send the email or whatever, and literally it's just staff yeah. that's, that's watching this, right? Yeah. And people gravitated to you like, okay, so who is it today? Because, you know, <laughs> which I, I just, and just your, edu your education, it, that was your bus moment. I saw you having the bus moment that you were just talking about, turning your music on loud. I just now, those were those moments of when people were coming up to you and you, the joy you felt in walking them through who it was, oh, you're going to need to know about this person because they are boom, boom, boom. I was just listening to that. And now that you've mentioned what you just said about you coming up, being on the bus, having your, your headphones blasting and hoping somebody would ask you, yo, what is that? Do you realize that's exactly what you're doing right now? I'll never connect those dots, Astor, I promise you. Like You're, you're welcome. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> listen, listen that, that's literally what, what, what it is. Like, bro, that's literally what it is. And so, look, Tiny Desk has gained, I mean, significant popularity, even after years of existence, as I alluded to earlier. What do you think has contributed to its current moment of prominence like this, bro? And, and, and how do you see it continuing to evolve as this cultural uh, touchstone that kind of celebrates the diverse tapestry of music genres and artists that make up the culture. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 what we started with, man, culture. We finally tapped mm -hmm. into the culture, you know what I mean? You know, 
Tiny Desk started uh, in 2008, and it was just uh, it was just a fun thing to do. Um, created by Bob Boylan, whose desk that the people still perform at is 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 his work desk. Um, but it just started. He he's another just a music nerd who loves music. They were at South by Southwest, and um, they were at just some small venue where it was too loud, and he ended up inviting um, the artist to come and play at the desk, just as almost like a joke. Mm-hmm. Um, but for but for many many years, it was just it was Bob and maybe a couple of others, and just bringing the bands that they loved, and it was it became a really really cool thing. But around 2014, uh, people like myself, Franny Kelly. Abby O'Neill, Sidney Madden, Rodney Carmichael, we began to pitch things that we thought would make a difference. So for us in 2014, we had T-Pain. And the key component and the thing that that still to this day makes Tiny Desk special is that it's intimate. It yes. takes what you're used to seeing on a big stage and shrinking it and challenging the artists to do something that they aren't used to and possibly come in with something special. And T-Pain is still the perfect example of what Tiny Desk is. T-Pain known for auto-tune. Yep. Right? And, you know, we're, we're not doing that at the Tiny Desk. We're stripping all of that away. That's right. He leaned into that challenge. And what happened was something so special. It became our, it became our first viral moment. And so many people, millions of people, discovered that T-Pain can sing. No, he's a beast. A beast. And and it just opened it just opened our eyes, it opened his eyes. It, it it created a whole new lane for him. And that's when that was the lightning in the bottle for our culture where it's like, okay, wow, R&B can be very special at the tiny desk. And then we continue to move forward. Franny bought Gucci Mane, who is, you know, known for street rap he's a trapper you know what i mean and before then there was not no hip-hop like that at the desk right we tried it out he has zaytoven on the on the piano and i wouldn't it, it wouldn't I, it doesn't go down in history as one of the best tiny desk concerts ever but it proved that an artist like gucci main belonged in that space too you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. so from there it just trickled down man it just trickled down and we continued to lean into it and we started to contribute what we thought would work best. And I mean, and the proof is in the pudding, you know, uh, tiny desk drives the most diverse. It drives the youngest audience that NPR has ever seen. Mm. It's over 50% people of color. Mm. And it's something that the company has been trying to, uh, bring in for a very, very long time. And it's because of what we've done at the tiny desk, over the years and continue to lean into it up until just a few weeks ago, once again, a huge cultural moment at Juvenile's Tiny Desk. And Oh, that was crazy. And that was so crazy. Things. And so it was the consistency. Um, it's the consistency that that's going to continue to drive us. Just stay consistent and lean into it. Like, yes, like maybe you wouldn't expect, uh, I don't know, you name it a JID, or maybe you wouldn't expect X rapper to play at the Tiny Desk but you're always going to pull out something special there because when you listen to hip hop records, it hits hard. It's loud, a right. lot of studio effects. But when you strip all of that away, you just, you find things that you never ever discovered in their music 20, 30 years later. You know what I mean? You know, and even with the Juvie one, even that was kind of pulling teeth in this day to make happen. Like that was a whole like challenge, right? Man, like, <laughs> It's going to go down as one of, to me, one of the most endearing, uh, just most fun stories in music of 2023. Yeah. Because the man did not even know who we were. That part, like literally. He didn't know who we were. His team didn't know. He even went on went on Twitter like, yo, what the F is a tiny desk? And no, also, no, I'm not doing it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, a couple of weeks later, I get a DM from management. I know I get a DM from him because he gets such an onslaught of tweets like, no, fam, like a group like Freddie Gibbs and other artists who played the Tiny Desk, like, no, OG, you got to do this because it's right. Y and Z. 
And finally, he's like, yo, OK, OK, I get it now. I understand. Like if this tweet gets 10,000 retweets, I'll consider. And less than a day that went crazy. And yeah, just history was made. You know, we, we, we quickly got on the line. They allowed me to kind of, you know, they didn't know what to do. So I was like, you should do these songs. And they almost hit my set list to a T, you know. Oh, that's so dope. We got really, really close. And the band and album, they were amazing. And it was just a special moment. And now the man is overbooked. Listen, man, and if that and the T-Pain example are not amazing examples of sometimes you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. When you yeah. talked about T-Pain, auto-tunes, and, and Tiny Desk being like the live performance of all live intimate performances where, you know, auto-tunes is, is probably not going to be in that space. Yeah. But look what birthed that. Like yeah. it, it, an outlet of, of showing and showcasing the true talents of this dude that many of us really had no clue yeah. about. Yeah. With Juvie, it's this resurrection of his career almost. But it, it came at the expense of individuals having to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And you helped with that. You know, many of us live this like every day though, right? Exactly. Of getting right comfortable, being uncomfortable. But it's great to hear these stories and how they've impacted even the platform. Yeah. And in an era of like mass content output, I mean, like we're on content overload oh. across all mediums. Tiny Desk, though, really stands out as this amazing, curated, and like you say, intimate space. How does the platform curate these performances, though, to provide a more like meaningful or authentic experience for both the artists and the listeners? Yeah, it, it takes a lot of trust on both ends, mm. you know, because once we agreed to do this, once there's agreement on both sides, like, hey, I'm coming to play Tiny Desk. Hey, we're going to host you. It's a lot of conversation about like, listen, this is a real, you know, you were there. It's a real office. It's a regular office in a, at a regular with, with people working. <laughs> people working. There are no studio tricks. This isn't a sound stage. You are going to have to take it back to when you were first doing this, beating on the table or jamming somewhere. You have to take it back to that. And also, you have to be able to deliver because you are fully exposed. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't hide behind anything. You can't hide. You can't hide behind uh, the auto tune, or you can't hide. But you know, you you know, the music the music industry is filled with a lot of tricks that make artists sound great. So I tell them ahead of time, like we don't amplify the voice. We don't. There's none of that. You just have to be able to sit at that desk and perform. Um, so it just takes a lot of trust on both ends. You know. And, you know, I think for our, our responsibilities is to let them know exactly what they're getting themselves into. Um, and many accept the challenge and more people than a lot more people. People would be surprised of surprised by the amount of people who don't accept the challenge respectfully. You know what I mean? Wow. That's um, wow. And. I, I, you know, I have to respect it. You know what I mean? I, I much rather people say, you know what? Mm, not for me. than go in and, and, and embarrass themselves. Because like I said, that you can't hide behind anything. Either you have the talent or you don't. <laughs> well, well, listen, when you talk about the hiding behind, you know, I even think about some of them that I've watched and even the background singers. I mean, sometimes are hello like you talk about not hiding some of the lead artists that you're bringing on when they bring these backgrounds in i believe it was babyface i don't know if it was babyface or charlie wilson who was, had they both had amazing they both had amazing background singers but babyface particularly brought stars no so so was the babyface one was that avery shante moore and tank it and tank yes. and let, yes. let me tell you something for the record i'm so glad we can have this conversation for the Let's record talk about it. <laughs> avery Avery. Yeah. Now this young man, so I, I connected with him with my daughter years ago because he was on kind of this Broadway run and TV run where he was trying to get on TV shows and, and, and Broadway when, while my daughter was on Broadway. So they would show up at auditions together. Oh. And I would hear this dude sing. I was like, oh, this dude is different. Yeah. I mean, effortless. Yeah. It was effortless then. And this is, it's, it's this like is almost that. not even, no, no what, five, five, seven years ago. And I knew he had this effortless ability, mm -hmm. but bro, when I saw him with baby face and he got that moment, I mean, even Tank 
And Tank is a complete problem in Beast. Yeah. And Shantae Even Tank Moore as well. Shantae Moore, they both had to step aside like, hold on, hold on. <laughs> what just happened? But you know what that speaks to, though? Of just how great Babyface is. Mm. It speaks to to know that how comfortable he is in what he what he provides. To Lesson. Be able to, and the, the lack of ego. Lesson. To say, I'm bringing stars in their own right to back me up, who could clearly steal the show. But I have nothing. You know, you got to put some respect on Babyface's name because, like, it was a reminder. You know, he did come. You know, Tiny Desk, for me, I always make it my duty to bring a few artists from time to time just to remind people of how great they are. Mm. And it it amazed me just by how humble he was. You know, mm. I talked about earlier how, you know, we have a meeting of the minds and we usually have to have bring the teams together to talk about what's going to happen. When I booked Babyface and we got on a Zoom, I totally expected a manager, an MD, mm -hmm. a publicist. No, it was Kenny Babyface Edmonds in the name. Kenneth, guy. Kenneth, Kenneth showed up. And <laughs> his publicist says, hey, I have Kenny, here you go. And it was just him and I on Zoom. And I had to just sit there for a minute like, okay. Wow. <laughs> Didn't expect this. And he proceeds to go down and run down exactly what you guys saw on YouTube. I'm going to have Avery Wilson. I'm going to have Tank. I'm going to have Shantae Moore. And I'm just going to run off all of these hits that I've written and performed over 30, 40 years. And I'm like, my, my job is done. My job is done. <laughs> but, but, but you know what else you just kind of highlighted? the true essence of a leader. And what I mean by that is you said Babyface was so confident within his offering to be able to provide a platform for other amazing talents that could potentially outshine or do whatever him, but knowing that's almost his responsibility to use his yeah. platform yeah. for others to showcase their gifts without feeling like he was going to lose something. And man, Asta, you know this, man. You you've been in a lot of these rooms, and it's a lesson we could all learn and and really apply to what we do as leaders. Because ultimately, babyface looks better. You know what I'm that saying? Part. And I think ego gets in the way sometimes. That oh, they're gonna steal my shine, or they're gonna outperform me. No, like we know who's we know who's front and center. Mm -hmm. It makes you look better. It makes the show, like, ultimately, it doesn't matter who shines. It's about the show at the end of the day. It's mm -hmm. about how can we come up with the best show possible. And I try my best to apply that with everything that I do, um, with having a host of young people who work with me, trying to, like, step aside a little bit and say, no, nah, you you do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you step up. Like, no, you be on the camera because ultimately – that helps all of us, you know? That's I mean? right. So That's right. I, I saw that, and I, I love when that happens at the desk, and it happens a lot. You know, even last year with Usher, he did the same thing. He had he had, he had, had beasts back at him, you know what I mean? Because he knows at the end of the day, I'm Usher. That's right. I'm Usher. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So now, nah, man, I just, having Babyface there and just knowing what he has contributed to our culture for so many decades and just him being a a superstar just saying okay you got whatever you want even afterwards funny thing for as long as that show was he did about eight to ten more minutes after we wrapped of songs no no he didn't he did man he did you know using tiny desk concerts should normally they run 15 to 20 minutes yeah his was 30 wow and then he did another eight to ten minutes after that and then he goes after we rap. He's like, "Oh, we just did that for fun. You can keep it or not." Rony, uh, my my my, he he kept. Come on, running. man! Come on! <laughs> it was. But you know what? Man. I I think about it. I mean, music really has the power to bring people together and create shared experiences like nothing else. I mean, it's evident in what you just said. And how do you believe Tiny Desk kind of fosters this sense of community? 
around music lovers and, and what role do you think it plays in connecting artists and their audience? Man, that that didn't hit me as much as it hit me uh, after the COVID pandemic. Mm. Um, we had to pivot like a lot of us around that time. Um, and we started doing Tiny Desk home concerts. And soon as like in February or March, when they told us like, we're not going back to the office, we had to figure out a way to continue what we were doing. We had a mm-hmm. nice backlog. We had about 18 or 19 shows to kind of put out and spread out. But after that, I was like, yo, what, what do we do? So Bob, the creator, reached out to all of the producers of uh, Tiny Desk and said, hey, reach out to any artist you can think of and tell them to just put their phone up and just perform. And that snowballed two, two plus years of shows. They got bigger and bigger. But when we were all locked in, those moments we, we, were, we couldn't go anywhere, our audience and our community leaned on what we were doing so hard. Mm. Um, and if I look in our YouTube comments long enough during that time, I can get really, really emotional because people lean on music. And I thought I was one of a few, but I was one of billions who just rely on that connection of music. Mm-hmm. Even the artists, now that we have artists coming back, We'll have an artist who played a Tiny Desk Home concert actually come behind the real desk and they even say, oh, my God, I spent hours watching Tiny Desk Home concerts when I had nowhere to go, when I couldn't go to concerts, when I couldn't go to parties and connect with people through music. Tiny Desk Home concerts is all I had. And I can just talk to my community in these chat Mm. rooms and say, whoa, did you see that? And now it's just I think that it's just so important. Important man, and that in the aspect of community, like you just said, I, I never felt that more than when we were locked inside with nothing but our computer screens and what right. the artists gave us to, to to put out. The most, the best one when it comes to the home concerts, when it came to really providing a feel, I can think of two, but one was Kirk Franklin. Mm. And <laughs> it had us all crying. Because we were locked in. We couldn't do anything. And the power of that music when we couldn't go to church and we could. That's right. provided everything. And another one was Janae Aiko. She was just, it was like a 20 minute meditation. She had sound bowls and, you know. It was a thoughtful experience, a thought out experience. Man, we were all worried. We didn't know what the future held. But like in that 15, 20 minutes, everything was all right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So no, I think um, I think it's so important, and I, I'm I'm blessed to be a small part of providing that experience to so many people. You know what I mean? Yeah, there there goes your humble nature again. It's ah. a very large part, <laughs> but you know, another community. You know, we're celebrating 50 years of hip hop, yeah. right? Which in itself is like crazy, mind blowing. Mm. How do you envision the platform continuing its role in helping to shape the future of hip hop and its yeah. legacy? I think um, the important thing is being brave and smart in our choices. Um, I think it's it's my responsibility to show um, the country, the world, just how diverse hip hop music and hip hop culture is. It's, uh, it's so important to me. Because when I think about the journey of hip hop at the tiny desk, it's really, really parallel to the journey of hip hop in society. Mm -hmm. We had to fight for people to recognize that we were a um, sophisticated genre. We were a layered and 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 like multi layered and multi dimensional musical genre and culture that we had much more to offer than what was on the surface. You know, so I think. is really parallel. Like we really had to kind of prove our worth. And now where we are today with hip hop music being the most important export in America, the the most important American export in the world and hip hop music being the most popular genre in the world. I think it's really important for at the tiny desk, our small part is to continue to show 
just how much hip hop has to offer and mm. don't do it the safe way. We can totally be safe and pick the safe choice. But I think when you look at our history and you look at the special shows out there, it's when we got brave in our choices and even challenged ourselves. That's when we really got the magic, the juveniles, the Anderson packs, the things that the artists that people don't necessarily expect us to bring, but providing something that they can't forget. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like you, like we said earlier, staying out of the comfort zone, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm still, you know, I still get nervous and scared and I worry about those things. But like, you know, that reminds us, you know, we alive inside. You know, what I'm that's saying? right. You know, it's funny. I, I, I tell my oldest daughter when she goes to auditions and all that or she's about to perform and I ask her, so you nervous? And she's like, yeah, I'm like, all right, good. Because if you weren't nervous, we'd have a problem. Yeah. Like you you have to have those nerves to turn into your reminder of, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm made for this. Yes. This is God's plan. Yes. God's given me the gift. This is my opportunity. But if you don't have that little bit of nerves, then there's too much of a comfort, yeah. like of of expectancy, like, yeah. oh, I got this. You never want to feel like you fully got this, but you do want to feel like you got to show up and respond to the nerves that you know are not really valid. So That's I'm right. glad that you that you even have that anxiety or those nerves before an episode, and then you click in like, oh, no, we here. We, we going to rock. This is, is going to be... Then only then does that stuff subside you know what i'm saying like only in that moment leading up to it bro come on man like but i care man i just care so much about it and i just yes, want do. to be the best yes you do and and you know hip-hop obviously big big part of black culture yeah. um and black culture as we know it is often borrowed appropriated or even used to inspire many other you know cultures and industries what, what's your thoughts on the importance of black ownership and recognition of what it is that the black community has kind of brought to the world? I mean, it's been proven through history that if we don't tell these stories, somebody else will. Mm. And they will leave out the facts. Like mm. it's just been proven time and time again. Um, but that takes a lot of bravery. I, you know, I talk about bravery a lot because... You know, I've been in rooms where I was I was afraid to I was intimidated. I was afraid to, like, speak on things and really contribute to what I think would help make it special. So, you know, it took a lot. It took a lot of years for me to build up the the gunk to say, yo, we should like we should really be intentional about who we're serving and who we're like. We should say this is for you. We should say mm -hmm. we're doing black music month. We're doing Latinx Heritage Month. We're doing AAPI. This is for you. It's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. It's not expecting right. anybody. It's just saying, thank you for helping us do numbers. This is for you. And then we'll get back to everybody else because if you look at, you know, we cast a wide net when it comes to who we bring and what type mm -hmm. of and what type of people we bring at the tiny. We cast a wide net. We try not to have any blind spots, but it's important for black people to tell our stories because we know and it's just been proven that somebody else will and they will mix all they will mix the names and faces and <laughs> all they will mix it all up to the point where we accept it like you know that part you know what I'm saying so I just think it's man it's it's a duty like we have to we have to tell our stories man we have to I love that it, so you know what in telling stories, talk, talk about the importance of your relationship with God in your journey. And, and I only ask that because so many think they're really going through this thing called life on their own. And that feels like such a heavy burden to carry, to be honest. Man, ask the bro, look, in this part of my journey right now, I've been doing this for 23 years. Yep. I've been in NPR for 23 years. And I spent a lot of those years like stagnant, running in place, content, um, being sort of like felt to feel like, like this is what I'm contributing. Like this is my ceiling. And I should have quit a long time ago. I should have quit. I totally like where I am right now, 23 years in, I should have given up, you know what I mean? It's nothing but God. 
You know, mm-hmm. it's nothing but God still telling me, son, stay here, stay on this path because you will run into your, your purpose will meet you. You know what I mean? Mm. You're going you're gonna to meet it. You know, my, um, I'm looking for a new church home right now because my pastor, uh, left not too long ago and things are not going well. So I, I was home in St. Louis. I went home this past week to St. Louis and I haven't, you know, I haven't been to church in a few weeks and I was able to go back to my church where I grew up in, you know what I mean? And it was of all the things I love going home to see my boys and all of that, but I was, I didn't even text my mom a couple of times. I cannot wait to go to church with you. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, just to be reminded and being in the house and be reminded of who provided all of this. You know what mm. I'm saying? I give all of this to God. You know what I mean? Sure, I work hard. Sure, I have a unique perspective. All of that. But knowing where I come from, I know, I know who got me here. Listen. You know, a lot of us, especially black men, you know, we get to, we get to, we get into these spaces. And sometimes we, you know, we tell ourselves a lot, like, I'm, I, I'm not even supposed to be here. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when we think about, I've been taught by a lot of people that, you know, success is relative. You know what I mean? You know, it's, it's. It's so important to kind of look back on where this thing started to kind of like remind you that, yeah, you might, I might not, I'm nowhere near where I want to be. But if I just look back at the start, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm reminding and God reminds me that like, bro, like if it stops today, you know, I put you in spaces. Like we met in Paris, France, Aston. You know what I'm saying? That part, that part. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm not supposed to be there. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Society told me I'm not, statistics told me I'm not supposed to be there. Right. All those things told me I'm not supposed to be there. You know, I'm, you see, you know, you, you, I've been a part of just like surreal moments mm-hmm. and, and I'm doing the thing that I actually love. And I know that everyone doesn't always get to that place. People mm-hmm. work really, really hard. People in my family have worked really, really hard. All I know is hard work, but people have to provide for their children and their families, and they may not be able to step into their dream. They got to feed the family. Mm-hmm. So I know. I know where it comes from. I, I think that talking about you know my journey and how long it's been, <clears throat> I spent a lot of years with the blinders off, and I'm looking at, like, well, damn, I'm a better DJ than this person or, you know, I know more about music than this one. And it just took a long time for me. I, I spent a couple years like thinking that somebody else's journey is somebody else's journey is mine. Like, nah, that's, that wasn't mm. mine. This is mine. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And God gave it to me. Actually. So to answer your question, it's everything. Bro. It's everything. I, I, I so know that. And I'm so glad you shared that. And another reinforcement that we serve a, a miracle serving God, yeah. right? Like we we truly don't hope for miracles. We depend on miracles because mm-hmm. it's it's way bigger than us and, and we're not that good or that smart to be able to figure all these moves out. Oh, oh, but man. through his oh. grace, through his grace, he uses us as these vessels of purpose, which you are definitely being used as a, def- a, a, a vessel of purpose. And I'm so glad that you give him all the glory and it's it, it's evident in everything that you do, which is so dope. Because again, to your point, meeting you in Paris, I've only known you as a DJ for years until <laughs> recent. Dog, until re- I'm like, yo, because he don't, he ain't at, at NPR doing no tiny. What are you talking about? He's a DJ. They're like, dog, no, he's the producer. I'm like, come on, stop. <laughs> and like, yo, Bobby, you really the producer type? Like, how do you do that? You, you've been a DJ to me all these years, me. But, but you know what, Aster? The DJ informs everything. I'm a DJ first. You know what I'm saying? Like Thanks. my DJ, like the way we cure, the way I cure all of that is, is it all stems from the DJ. Amber. Which again is who's the master architect of all this? God. It's all God. Indeed. Not so, so now look, we got the opening scene to your life documentary, bro. It's about to start. Mm. What song is playing and why? Hmm. <laughs> it's Stevie Wonder Superwoman. Oh. 
um, it was the first song ever. I was, I just got this feeling like I did not know that. I was, I never forget. I was sitting in the basement. My mom said, "Man, my mom, we have the record player downstairs, digging through our records." And when that song came in, you know, if you listen to Sis Superwoman, there's so many movements to it, and it goes into place. When you, fr I try to always take my stuff myself back to that very first moment I heard that song, and I wish there was a camera there because my eyes are like, what is what? going on? Yeah. <laughs> and I want to feel this feeling again. So Superwoman is the, the song that just like unlocks something in my brain where like I can't believe this piece of vinyl from this man that I don't know, like brings me not only joy, but like feelings that I can't even describe. Yet. Evoked you know so much, evoked so oh much. Oh my God, bro. Like it's, it's with you no, know, it's Stevie Wonder Superwoman, man. That song, I just like. Son, it, you're never, you're never gonna get an argument with a Stevie song. You you really, I mean. what? Omega. Listen, <laughs> so look, you know, we, we always close with the question of the three seeds that you'd want to leave with the stewards of culture moving forward? What are those three things that you'd want to leave? Uh, the first one is courage. Yeah. Um, I do my best to work with younger people who remind me of myself and just younger people across the board to like encourage them like to like have courage. I know it's scary. I know sometimes when you're in your first job and if you're at, even if it's, if you're starting a business, whatever it is to just force yourself to have courage. It's painful mm -hmm. sometimes to like mm -hmm. break out of that thing where that just keeps you from moving or to st take, to keeps you from taking that step forward. But like courage is everything, man. It just, mm -hmm. I just believe that you have to have courage in this crazy world, you mm -hmm. know, to get anywhere. I think that the second one um, is authenticity. Mm. Um, I think I only got so far when I brought my whole self to the table. Um, I'm not exactly the most well spoken dude, you know, I'm I, I but you just have to be yourself. Yes. Because that's the most unique thing that you're going to bring into these rooms. That's right. Just right. yourself, like, unapologetically, if you, your English is broke, whatever, like, you know, I don't, I don't really like the cold sweet. I mean, it's, it's just important to be who you are. You Max. I mean, I think sometimes, you know, I hate to keep going back to Tiny Desk, but when we, sometimes when we bring rappers to the Tiny Desk and they're, they're performing, I see them kind of being reserved or not cussing or like censoring themselves. And every so every so often I have to walk up and just whisper and is it like, yo, do you. Do you. <laughs> do you, fam. You're here for a reason. You know That's what I'm right. saying? Do you. So yeah, authenticity is is super important to me, man. Um the third one is simple, is kindness. <laughs> um so much easier to be kind to people, man. Um, is it easier or is it, it's actually, it, it seems like more work at times. It seems like more work, but when you make a hat, when, when you make a habit of it, it becomes hard. second nature. Yeah. It's like second nature. Now, not get it. I'm a human being. You know what I'm saying? We deal with, you know, what we deal with <laughs> man. Listen, <laughs> but you get the best results if you come into it. And it's like you said, it, it can be hard at times, but, in habit, and once it becomes like second nature, it just you just get the best results, man. I yep. sometimes I see sometimes I know people the higher up they move or they're in a high position or whatever. I mean, I'm like, yeah, it's nicer the more you move up. You know what I mean? That you part. Know, you know what I mean? Like, most of us didn't deserve any of this. <laughs> you know, we're all saying? stewards. We're all stewards of it. We're, we're Look, we own none of this. That's none right. of this is ours. None of this is ours. So I just, and especially in a time now where we're all going through something, Aster. We yeah. all wake up every morning with a heavy cross to bear. Yep. We're all going through some heavy, heavy things in our life, man. All of us. 
Mm-hmm. There are things that 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 we don't share with other people. There are just things that that we struggle with, mental health, all of these things. So it's just like it's just important to be gentle with folks. You know what I mean? Be easy mm-hmm. on folks. And it's hard. I mean, you you know you've seen like it's a high stress environment in that in that space of tiny desk, but it's just like. A kind word, a joke here and there, that just goes so far. You know, so I mean, far. even somebody with some kindness, you just don't realize how far that can go with certain people, you know? That's right. So, and, yeah, that's and the, it. And, and, and grace. I got from what you were saying, grace. There's, yeah. there's a grace. And and I saw and I see you move with a level of grace. And I, I want to say, dog, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud and happy of all that you're doing. Um, this is just the beginning. There's even more to come in the story, but I'm just thankful for your commitment. I'm thank you for allowing God to use you the way that he's using you. And I'm telling you right now, well done and love you, bro. Love you too, brother. And I, and I, I, the the feeling is so, so mutual, man. I, I, um, I've looked up to you for a long time, man. I looked to you as an OG, excuse me, for a long time. And just recently, not too long ago when you did, uh, the sneak the uh the, the complex sneaker show and I was able to learn more about your story, man. I'm just I want to say to you, I'm 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 equally as proud of you, man, because you don't know how much you inspire people like me, man. Mm. We have to have that, G. So nah man, thank you. Thank you, Aster, for real. Love you too, man. Thank you, bro. We truly appreciate your support because it helps us fulfill our mission of promoting cultural awareness and personal development. Please click the subscribe button below to help ensure and solidify our mission.